I expect unionists and loyalists to continue to throw the middle finger up to the conversation. I expect republicanism to sort of continue to look at a bonfire and think of it as just a big pile of hate and sectarianism. This is Here's How, Ireland's political, social and current affairs podcast, presented by William Campbell. Thank you for downloading episode 142 for the 1st of September, 2022. I discovered a big discrepancy. Well, I didn't so much discover it as notice it, and it isn't really a big discrepancy, it's an enormous discrepancy. A gigantic discrepancy, a sort of so big you could see it from space discrepancy. This is the discrepancy. Have a look at daft.ie any day. On the front page, you can choose to browse by selection and go to rental properties. No filters. Look at the whole country, any type of residence. Much has been made of this. These days, you'll normally get less than 800 properties for rent in the whole country. Of course, some properties that go up for rent don't go on daft. They're rented by word of mouth or via social media contacts or a postcard in the window of the local shop. But daft on their website say that 90% of property sales in Ireland are on their site. So it's a good guess that daft have the bulk of rentals there and movements up and down in their number of listings match the market pretty closely. Now go to the census results. There were 166,000 vacant properties on census night this year. There have been various attempts to poo-poo this figure, but I've spoken to the CSO and they are very confident in their figure. One reason is because their enumerators visit the property several times before and after census night if they don't get in touch with any residents. They talk to neighbours and they ask if anybody lives there and when somebody lived there last. Also, enumerators lose pay if a house on their patch doesn't return a census form, so they're highly motivated to get it right. And we have a breakdown of what sort of houses are vacant. 23,000 are vacant because they're undergoing renovation. 27,000 are vacant because the last occupant died. And 35,000 are vacant because they're available to rent. 35,000. Let that figure sink in for a minute. 35,000 homes were vacant, awaiting a tenant, on census night this year. Compare that to less than 800 being listed on daft. The figures don't overlap, by the way. They were marked down as one category, renovation, occupant, deceased, or for let. Some may fit into two categories, but they were put in one category or the other, not both. So which figure is right? Are there 800 properties to rent in the country, or 35,000? You don't have to spend long in a pub on a Friday night, or on social media, to hear stories of the incredible difficulties that home seekers are experiencing, to know that the 800 figure is the one that's far closer to the truth. And the market doesn't lie. Rents have been shooting up by more than 12% per year. The basic law of supply and demand tells you that there isn't a huge idle supply out there. If there was, Why would desperate would-be tenants be willing to pay ever-increasing rents? So where in the hell is the CSO getting 35,000 properties to rent from? I rang them up and I asked, and they were nice enough to talk to me, even give me the odd hint of some of the statistics that aren't finalised for publication yet. The first thing is that of all those vacant properties, about 30% of them were recorded as vacant in the 2016 census too. So, barring the occasional coincidence, we can conclude that they've been vacant for six years or more. Think of that. 50,000 homes 
vacant continuously for the past six years or more while people are emigrating because they can't get somewhere to live. People with jobs, people with good jobs taking the boat because they can't get a house, not even to rent. This has led to a lot of abuses in the rental market and, unsurprisingly, a lot of legislation to curb those abuses and demands for even more legislation. But why would people who own houses, 35,000 houses, previously rented out, not rent them out again when they could do it in a heartbeat? I think I know why. They don't need the money and they don't need the hassle. Property prices are shooting up. These 35,000, they're not houses. They're made of bricks and mortar. They have windows and doors, rooms and a roof, but they aren't houses. They are bank accounts. And they are bank accounts that pay a hundred times more interest than putting the money on deposit in the Bank of Ireland. The owners don't need the extra cash they would get from rent, and they view the ever-increasing regulations as making renting them out more trouble than it's worth. There's good reason to believe that well-intentioned laws to protect tenants are contributing to keeping properties off the market. Now, many of these regulations are absolutely required, but they are a two-edged sword. For a major corporate landlord, they're no bother, but for the accidental landlord, someone who inherits a house, someone who bought a second house for whatever reason, it's a hassle that they don't need. And, of course, the fact that we have basically no property taxes in Ireland, no penalties at all for vacancy or dereliction, means that there is no push factor to get these properties onto the market. So regulation isn't the only issue here, not by a mile. But we have an excruciating housing crisis in Ireland, and only a lunatic would imagine that can be resolved without bringing vastly more housing on stream, the right houses in the right places, both new build and existing vacant properties. Trying to fix the housing crisis with more regulation, quite likely, is making the situation worse. No regulations will solve the problem without hugely more appropriate supply. And if we have hugely more appropriate supply, most of the new regulations won't be needed anyway. Supply is the solution to focus on. In a moment, we'll have that interview with Joelle Keyes. But first, I want to say thanks to all of the patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate everyone who donates on Patreon. We don't get a huge amount of money out of it, not nearly in the same league as some other Irish podcasters, but it pays for web hosting and other costs of the podcast. And Kevin and myself basically donate our time for free. And it's also a great morale booster. When we get a new patron, it lets us know that there are people out there who listen and appreciate the podcast. We make a big effort to cover things that are undercovered in Irish media. And you're more than welcome to listen for free. But if you think that you could donate the same as those other donors and throw in the price of advertising a house on Daft once or twice a month, there's details how to do that on the website and at the end of the show. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Follow at Here's How Podcast on Twitter and like Here's How on Facebook for updates on each show's contents. Joel Keyes is a young loyalist activist. Uh, Joel, I'm delighted to have you on the podcast. I have to say, God bless your ambition. You've got a very interesting Twitter account, but one of the most interesting things on it is that you say in your bio that you are a future MLA. I suppose I can't fault your confidence there either. What party will you be standing for? Uh, none of them at the minute. None of them at the minute. And who who would be closest to your views? Of all of the parties that I've looked at, the UUP were probably the closest that I considered joining. 
Okay, they were closest okay. to getting the approval, yeah. And you live in Loyalist Belfast. I don't know if you're formally in East Belfast, but you're obviously from the Loyalist tradition there. The UUP haven't been terribly strong there. The DUP, I mm. think, are probably amongst unionist parties, the dominant party there. Mm-hmm. And I can see going back a year or two, and I realise you're relatively young, so going back a year or two is perhaps a longer time for you. But Mm -hmm. you spoke to the House of Commons Northern Ireland Committee, and you were a member of what was called the Loyalist Communities Council. Now, that's a legal organisation, but its membership includes the UVF, the UDA, Red Hand Commandos. They would be, in the past, have been known for very serious sectarian murders and also probably some of them currently involved in racketeering and drug dealing. You're someone who I know thinks a lot about the future of Northern Ireland. Do you think that the future of Northern Ireland runs through the sort of people who are involved with the LCC? No, quite the opposite. I would say the LCC um, being a legal organisation, like I understand the need for it. Um, I understand the need for there to be a sort of a way for those types of people to engage with uh, public figures and, and government and stuff like that um, without just showing up with their UVF or UDA membership cards. You know, I, I can understand why that wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that going into the future, um, you'll probably find that organisations like the LCC, will probably just naturally kind of cease to exist. Um, I've asked this of other unionists before. Would you agree that leadership amongst the unionist community is abysmally bad? Yeah, well, I would say that unless it's good leadership, it's not leadership at all. Um, We've got people that fill the positions of leaders here, but um, do we see any of our, say, unionist politicians in our areas trying to educate young people or even just influence them, even just come in the areas and say, look, here are our policies, here, here's why you should support them. No, we don't get any of that. And so I would say that they're, they're, they're more just fulfilling a, a, a role. They're not, they're not real leaders. And who are you referring to specifically there? Um, anyone who, I suppose anyone who would claim to be a leader. Um, I, I look at our, our areas and I say, these are areas without leaders. That's the problem here. Um, these are areas that they don't have people to look up to. They don't have people to follow. They have a lot of people who will come round to their doors um, every five years and ask for their vote, mm-hmm. uh, but they don't. They don't have people there in between. And there, there may be politicians out there who aspire to do things like that, who aspire to come into communities like mine uh, and engage with us, and that's fair enough. Um, but you, you, as, say, as you say communities. Yet, you say communities like mine. For people who don't know exactly what that is, g- give us a brief description. Yeah, so I, I, I live in Tokmona, um, but mm. it's by far from the only one like it. Um, I'm a loyalist area, uh, be described as working class. Um, a lot of people from these areas would be affected by poverty and drug and alcohol abuse, and there's mm. a lot of issues. Um, yeah, just your sort of iconic uh, working class council estates, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And when you spoke to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee of the House of Commons, over the internet as it was in COVID times. You said one thing that really struck a lot of people. It says, it worries me that we could potentially reach a point in this country or in any country where the people do feel they need to defend themselves. And you're referring specifically to violence there from context. What on earth is there that loyalists would need to return to violence to defend themselves from? Uh, Nothing as of yet. Nothing as of yet. And I think um, that was the 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 point that a lot of people missed in in the affairs committee remarks you know if you go back and you watch it there was plenty of times where i was very clear you know we have not reached a point yet where we we have that claim we have that justification we are not defending ourselves um what could happen there's a million things that could happen um i think for example here's one that you'll probably agree with Mm -hmm. um you know boris johnson and his buddies they've been passing some really concerning laws uh, in parliament recently you mean th- these ones that re- that restrict uh, freedom of demonstrations pretty much yeah um and it's not the only one i think i'd read of a couple more uh, that they can break up is it they can break up picket lines or something now there's restrictions on on uh, on striking workers picketing against perhaps agency workers who might be brought in to break a strike but i want i want to get a, a clearer answer on this because if you're yeah. talking about violence to defend yourself and you say that you're not at that point yet that's clearly an implication that you fear at least that there has been some movement in that direction even if you haven't reached that point what would that be 
I, I don't feel that we have moved um, in that direction in any significant way at all. Um, I think that we've come a long way since the Troubles. Mm-hmm. And if anything, I th- I'd say we're going the other way, which is why it's, it's so confusing to me why the, there's so many people out there that want a return to violence. It's like, even if that were sort of something that we were going to entertain, we would have to be moving at a certain trajectory and um, for me to get on board with that. And we're, we're going in the complete um, opposite trajectory. There are some people with concerns that things like the Northern Ireland Protocol and there's other pieces of legislation that have been passed, things like the Irish Language Act, that they mm-hmm. harm our place in the union. Mm-hmm. Um, now I would agree with the protocol. I would agree with opposing the protocol, but not so much with those other things that other people would would say causes fear within them that, that our place within the union is being attacked. Okay. Specifically, I was going to get onto it, but since you've brought it up, I'll, I'll talk about it now. The no- Northern Ireland Protocol is is something that in opinion polls is clearly supported by a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. MLAs who support the Northern Ireland protocol in the recent assembly elections were voted in in a majority, that's to say a majority of the very recently elected MLAs support it, and parties supporting the protocol got a clear majority of the votes. If there's any justification for the existence of unionism in Northern Ireland, it is that it constitutes a majority, or at least that was the justification that was given for close to a century. You can't then turn around and say, well, a majority support this, but we don't like it, therefore we have to overrule them. I think from from the unionist perspective, what the sort of argument would be is that yes, there may be a majority support, but we do have mechanisms in place for, the, for exactly those kind of things. Mm-hmm. So you can totally have a situation where there's a minority support for something or, in fact, a minority opposition to something. And because within that minority, the support or opposition is so widespread that we you know, we have that principle. It's the petition of concern. That's how mm-hmm. they can block legislation that one group of the community doesn't like. With well, the but that's legislation level, in the Assembly, which is not which is, where the Northern Ireland Protocol was passed. Uh, absolutely. The protocol is definitely um, a lot more, it's a bit more of a complicated um, area than just your average piece of legislation. Mm-hmm. And I will I will totally, totally uh, agree with that. You know, I don't think that there's just this simple answer sitting there that everyone should just accept to please loyalists. What The way I kind of look at the whole protocol situation is, first of all, you, ha- you had Brexit, which was kind of thrust upon us and it was kind of rushed into, and I'm, I totally agree there. The protocol was an outcome of Brexit. Mm-hmm. Um, now, do I think that loyalism should have a, a, you know, a veto on something like the protocol? Probably not. Um, you know, I would like some recognition and acknowledgement from within the anti-protocol movement, if you can really call it that. That mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, it's not Republicans' fault that the protocol is in place. Um, Republicanism is not who our uh, beef is with, I suppose is the word. Um, it was our own British government that passed that. And at the time, I'm pretty sure the DUP were supporting it too. Oh, hang on. Mm-hmm. And the DUP Pardon. did support it, yes. Yeah, so at the time, the DUP were supporting this too. And I think that we need to acknowledge that. Uh, and that's something that's not really being done, I don't think. Um, going forward from that, then what I would like to have seen happen is unionism slash loyalism turning around and going, OK, look, um, we've clearly made a mistake here. This protocol is is not acceptable to us. It puts a border down the Irish Sea. Mm-hmm. Um, effectively, we are not okay with this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would have liked to have seen us sort of reaching out the hand. Oops. And that's where the line died. And then I got a text message from Joel, and he said that he'd had a power cut because the meter had run out of credit and that he was pressing the emergency pound button and getting the lights and the computer started up again. And then we got back on Skype and tried to restart the conversation. Hit record there again. Um, we were on the protocol uh, and um, you had said that Republicans were not responsible for the protocol. Do you have that train of thought to continue with? Yes, I think it was just explaining that what I would have liked to have seen is unionism wakes up and we realise that the protocol was a mistake. Um, the DUP, then it shouldn't have had to come from the community. The DUP um, should have already been in there in the community getting opinions. So they should have already got the feedback that the protocol didn't have a whole lot of support and then people had serious issues with it. And then at that point, um, mm-hmm. what you do is once you realise that you've made this mistake, 
Um, first of all, you have to appreciate that it was your mistake uh, and your mistake alone. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, there's others to blame, but realistically, you know, the buck kind of stops with with our with our leaders, and our leaders are people like the DUP. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, once you go in with that kind of attitude going in, then it's not a, not a, an objective of all right, we need to now riot and do this and do that and blame the others, and we don't need to start a war. We're we're not trying to defeat anybody. What we're looking for is to approach people like SDLP, Sinn Féin Alliance, you know, explain the situation. You say, look, mm-hmm. we represent the, the loyalist unionist people of the, of the country and um, we've heard from the feeling on the ground that people don't support this. We want to try and make things right. And, you know, ideally what you would have seen is everyone coming together to work out a, a solution that doesn't um, piss off everyone pretty much. Okay, um, uh, pause with that for a second because yep. I want to uh, maybe look at the idea of why the protocol came about mm-hmm. a little bit differently in a minute. But the real issue, I think, with the protocol, the reason that it played so badly amongst loyalists, particularly I think maybe the people who live with you and around mm-hmm. you, is that the DUP are a fairly elite organisation. It's actually a very numerically small organization, even though it gets a lot of votes in Northern Ireland. They represent in the sense that they tend to win seats in areas where working class loyalists live, but they are not of those communities. They're relatively well off. They're, I suspect, far more religiously based than most loyalist communities. That's to say they draw their inspiration from religion rather than commenting on, you know, whether they're a member of one particular religion or, or another. And the the protocol very clearly exposed a chasm between yeah, the DUP so. and its voter yeah. base. That uh, would be true, and I mean, it? the feeling on the ground isn't, you know, people don't give the DUP all of those votes and then go and start celebrating about the DUP. It's very reluctant. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever I was talking to people in the run-up to the election, it's, you know, a lot of people said, yes, I'm going to vote DUP, but I'm not happy about it. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's definitely that gap. And, and, um, and that, and that is that that is what I'm talking about when there is a, just a very poor quality of leadership. And I don't particularly want to advocate for Sinn Féin or for any other party. But Sinn Féin particularly is very careful to be rooted in the community that it represents in a way that I think you would agree with me the DUP is not. And that is a strength that the loyalists slash unionist side of the House in Northern Ireland lacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's simply right. Okay. I don't think there's anything else I can add that. Okay. And what I take from that then is that when the DUP, going back a few years, got 10 MPs, which was kind of a lucky break for them, and got those 10 MPs at a time when they were critically needed and there was the, the Conservative Party did not have a majority in the House of Commons, they leveraged that to their own advantage, but I don't think they particularly leveraged it to the advantage of the community that votes for them, or certainly not for the wider community in Northern Ireland. And they're happy to collude with the British government many members of which would have difficulty finding Northern Ireland on a map. That is true, isn't it? Yeah. And and we're, we're, we're in danger of agreeing too much here, Joel. But the, the, <laughs> um, it, what, what I'm leading to is, and I'm looking and we're recording this, uh, we normally keep interviews in the can for a while just to allow ourselves in the podcast to organise it. But what I'm looking at in the last week or so was the death of David Trimble. And if you went onto the BBC website, you'd have to click into BBC News and then you'd have to click through into Northern Ireland News and you might see an article about the death of David Trimble. That was a banner headline on RTE, on the RTE website. You go straight to rte.ie and they had literally cleared the decks and put uh, photographs and articles about David Trimble right across their whole website. Similarly, when you had the the Assembly elections back a few months, right at the top of all Irish media, all Dublin-based media, or all, you know, 32-county media, whatever you want to call it, those results were being published and analysed in a lot of detail. Again, if you wanted to find them on BBC, you'd have to go into BBC, then you'd have to go into News, and then you'd have to go into UK News, and then you'd have to go into Northern Ireland News, and you might get a small little article about it. What puzzles, I think, an awful lot of nationalists, particularly nationalists in the South, is how unionists and loyalists are so devoted to a Britain that shows so little interest in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, I've heard this a lot, is the 
the rest of the UK don't really care about you. Um, and it's valid. You know, there's been a lot of English people on Twitter and, and elsewhere, you know, who who have openly admitted we don't really care what happens with Northern Ireland. Um, on the flip side of that, there's there's plenty of people with with deeper links, friendship links and, and family links. And, you know, those people seem to care a wee bit more. I think like everything, you've got people on both sides. And um, what I would say to the whole thing is that, like for me personally, I don't particularly care what the English think of us because it's just the same as as if sort of we had not liked the English and if we didn't care about the English, which a lot of us don't, if we're being completely pause, honest as pause, well. Pause, pause there, Joel. Pause there, Joel. Because, of course, you know, you will get a varying level of engagement and knowledge right across society. But I'm not talking about the average guy in a pub, the average woman in the mm. street. I'm talking about the elite of society, the political class, the media class. Karen Bradley, a Conservative Party MP, was appointed to be Northern Ireland Secretary, which essentially takes over the role of the First Minister when the Assembly is suspended as it is now. She wasn't aware that unionists vote only for unionist parties and nationalists vote only for nationalist parties and that people almost never cross those lines. That is a stunning level of ignorance, isn't it? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's probably why, you know, I don't know if you've heard, but I have before said that what I would like the, the Northern Ireland situation to look like is something where we're still economically tied to the United Kingdom. We still mm-hmm. get to take advantage of its defence capabilities, etc. But mm-hmm. that we do have a lot more freedom to kind of run our own affairs for that exact reason. England do not care about us. Um, the political class in England don't really seem to care about us. And, you know, I, I trust Northern Ireland to care about itself. I'm saying rather than trying to convince these English and convince these politicians to care about us, just let us do our own thing um, loosen the grip a little bit. Um, I'm still British. I still identify as British. I want to mm-hmm. be a, a member of the United Kingdom and a British citizen. But, you know, I, I totally take your point. And I think it um, it's why that we, we should have more kind of um, autonomy over our own affairs here so that we don't have to consult the English on everything. Um, and they can act more as sort of passive supervisors um, rather than um, gatekeepers, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Isn't the problem with that, though, that unionists in particular view the sectarian divide in Northern Ireland as a zero-sum game. There's no explanation for the opposition to the Irish Language Act other than saying, if them uns are getting something, it must be us losing something. Mm-hmm. What possible Irish... rationale is there for that? I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, going back till whenever I was 16, I did an interview with Susan McKay and she'd asked about the Irish Language Act and even going back to then, I struggled to mm-hmm. um, find a reason to oppose it. Um, more than that, there were a few concerns that I had, things like cost, and I was able to meet with uh, Linda Irvine down at the Turas Centre, mm-hmm. and she was able to walk me through every one of the concerns that I had, and you know, satisfied me with with her answers. So I wouldn't say that I'm someone who does oppose an Irish language act. Um, I think the problem with sort of tit for tat politics, which is sort of what you're describing, oh, unions are getting something, so we must be losing something, so we have to get something back. Um, that's kind of part of the problem here. I think everything needs to start being approached from a much more relaxed, I don't know if relaxed is the word, but I, I feel like it might be, um, mm-hmm. attitude. You know, everything isn't part of this massive game of chess sort of between Republicans and Unionists. Just because someone loses a piece or someone gains a piece, it, it's we're not enemies. What we're doing is trying to take all of that and put it all on the table so that we know what each other's opinions and and gripes and desires and hesitations are. And then Mm -hmm. Stormont should be the place where that's sort of organized and filtered and the tables and and data. And then we can work through it and we can say, all right, this Irish Language Act, they're not actually asking for very much. um, And so we're not going to oppose it. Maybe we don't get anything from it. Maybe it looks like the Irish speakers are getting something, but that doesn't matter. Um, Because that's what Stormont is for. It's to take the concerns of these people who speak this language. From my understanding is all these people really want is to be able to be recognised and live um, as if they were first Irish speakers. Um, And I I don't know why unionism is so hesitant to that. Now, I've heard that there's a concern that it's sort of like a Trojan horse. So Mm -hmm. it's just being pushed just to sort of weaken our position in, in the United Kingdom. Personally, I don't buy that. Um, I don't see how it weakens and, and our position what, what at do you all. Think, what, do you, what do you think of, for example, unionist-controlled councils taking legal action for allegedly breach of planning laws when somebody 
bolts up an ad hoc Irish language street sign to the side of their own house. Oh, is that what's happening? That, that has happened on occasion. It's just sad. Like, I just kind of hear it. And it, it, it reminds me of whenever I was in high school and there was people arguing over something stupid and you just kind of sit back and you, you, you watch it happen. And you know what? Like, it, it's it's clearly a, it's one of them arguments that I don't want to get muddy over. Um, For me, if you live in a house, it's your right to put whatever the hell you want on the house as long as it isn't a, a big sign calling for for you to go out and commit crimes or something. Um, so to me, it, I would describe it as quite stupid if councils are, are, are using their time to go after people who put up Irish signs on their own house. Oh, okay, okay. What, one thing I just want to kind of give you, going back 100 years, which in some cases might seem like a very long time, in some cases it might not, but the Northern Irish Parliament was established in 1921. It was abolished in 1973 at the, at the start of the Troubles that essentially collapsed. And there were general elections at regular intervals while it existed. In every single one of those elections, never did the total unionist parties fail to get less than two thirds of the vote. Every single time they got more than two thirds of the vote from the first to the last election. In the most recent assembly election, even if you throw in the PUP and you throw in, there's a couple of, a couple of independents who would be identified as unionists. Even if you throw in all of those votes, the TUV, the lot, the unionist vote comes out at 43%. The direction of travel there is pretty clear. And there have been some surveys, they mostly show that there is still a larger number of people in favor of the union than in favor of joining mm -hmm. the republic. But that's a pretty thin margin, and you don't need to wind that clock too far into the future to see that that is not a stable situation. And in fact, it is demographically possible to do it because you can see that uh, if you look at the distribution of unionists in different age cohorts, the only age cohort where unionists have a significant majority are the over 65s. And yeah. each with each time you go down in a demographic cohort, the nationalist majority is larger. And that's relevant because, for example, the under 18 nationalist majority is very, uh, very significant. They don't vote yet, but they will soon. But also the people of childbearing age, they very much have nationalists in the majority. So you can see, you can read that even further into the future. Mm -hmm. That's why you perhaps what some people might call your seniors in the unionist movement are so worried, isn't it? Well, they would say that they're not worried. I've asked the question myself. Um, I have said, look, this question, this constitutional question is baked into your very um, parliament. You know, it's kind of the, the basis of everything that goes on. Is It all comes back to this constitutional question. And I've asked the question to senior unionists and loyalists, you know, what happens when that balance of, of, of power tips? Mm -hmm. And sort of what the response you usually get is just, oh, it won't. Oh, don't worry. No, never. It'll never happen. And and it's disappointing for me because, you know, I would like to know. Um, I think it's certainly concerning, although not, not to the same extent that other people may describe. You know, fundamentally, I support the idea of living in a democracy and in a democracy, you're not always going to win. So Sinn Féin taking over um, as the largest party doesn't concern me as much as it seems to concern everyone else. Obviously, personally, I would like the party that I support to be in charge. But, mm -hmm. you know, whenever I don't support any of the other parties particularly strongly, it just doesn't worry me as much Sinn Féin getting in because what I want, my goal here, is to create a country where Sinn Féin can win and then we can win the next year and they can win the next year. And it sort of does just sort of tips and tats between them and, and they get their chance to govern and that's kind of the system that I want. So in a way, you know, in a weird way, it's not that I'm happy Sinn Féin won, but I think it was important. You know, if you said that we got two thirds of the of the vote every single election, mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing to kind of show unionists that you're not always going to be in charge. You're not always going to have the the steering wheel, and so mm -hmm. you're going to kind of have to learn how to how to behave whenever someone else gets it. And it seems to me anyway that our decision has been to just collapse the assembly. Um, I know it's officially that's over the protocol. Um, I don't doubt that that would be the one of the main motivations, but I suspect that another one of the main motivations would be that Sinn Féin have won, um, and that's definitely helped make their decision to collapse it, and it's a shame. It's just a shame all around. Okay. One thing that I want to develop with that, because I think that's literally the most important constitutional issue on the island, 
north and south. There's just no mm -hmm. question about that. And I think people underestimate the speed at which it is barreling down the path towards us. But essentially, one thing that, and I've tried to do with this with a whole bunch, and I hope you won't be offended to hear that you're not the only, only unionist that I've tried to get on the podcast. <laughs> not at all. Sometimes successfully, sometimes not. <laughs> um, but there is an enormous resistance, and you are a shining light of an exception to this, but there is an enormous resistance in unionism to discuss, and I suspect even to think about, what a united ireland including them would look like and what would be if they were to sit around a negotiating table what would be their list of priorities and i can understand that and i think napoleon uh, said something along the lines of once you have contemplated defeat you are lost but surely somebody in the million or so people on this island that are unionists, surely there should be somebody saying, well, in that event, this is what we should be looking for. But since there doesn't seem to be anybody doing that in public anyway, I'll ask you, if tomorrow or in a year's time or 10 years time, there was a vote and Northern Ireland voted to join the Republic and there was a vote in the Republic to accept that, and somebody said, okay, look, we accept there's 7 million people on the island, 1 million of them come from a unionist tradition and we should listen to their concerns and try to design a society, a constitutional framework and so forth that accommodated them to the best. What would you be looking for? Well, the way I like to look at it, the way I like to ask the question is, because I have asked it to people and people are remarkably more willing to engage in private than they are publicly. Um, the way I put it is sort of, you're a British citizen, you're, you identify as British. What does that mean? If you had to put it down into a list of things, what would need to remain, uh, or sort of what would I need to take away before you're no longer a British citizen? So y you've got things like the, the, like the passport. You know, I can apply and get a British passport that says that I'm a British citizen. Um, Defence, you know, if anything were to happen to Northern Ireland, um, the British Army would come in and sort of protect us. Economy. Um, so we're able to trade um, with the pound. We're able to trade with GB, and and, and that's great. Aside from that, um, there's not much else. Um, and and people kind of appreciate this. I think where the hesitation comes in, or I think the point of me saying that was all of those things. So defence, um, citizenship, and the economy. Like it's not completely out there to think that there could be some sort of system worked out where Ireland is under one kind of uh, federal body say mm -hmm. the, the island of ireland is ruled by one federal body mm -hmm. but that it's done in such a way where either certain people or people living in certain areas it, obviously i don't know how it would work but it, it's definitely not impossible that you could have a one country one island while also you've got this group of people who identifies as as british who have the protection of the british sort of state they've got citizenship in the british state and they can trade with the british state um, because they're part of it like obviously that's a really complicated subject it's just something that i would like to see discussed and um, it's 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 not impossible it doesn't feel impossible um intuitively and um, the hesitation for other loyalists and unionists to engage in the united ireland question publicly and um, i i understand it to be fair i i understand it their mindset seems to be uh, one of fear so it's one of distrust it's one of Yes, you you would say that. So if you were genuinely someone who's looking to destroy unionism, let's assume that that um, charge is true and that Republicans are just out to destroy unionism. Well, that's exactly what they would tell you then, is that the conversation's for everyone. Everyone's welcome. You can come and say what you want and we want to listen to you. And I can totally get why a lot of unionists kind of look at that with scepticism and say, well, hang on, when you've got republicanism, who are voting Sinn Féin in, and Sinn Féin, you know, is the sort of largest party supported by Republicans. Sinn Féin have committed all these horrible acts in the past that they don't want to apologise for, uh, and arguably that they're proud of. You know, it, it doesn't strike me as surprising that people are distrustful of the whole conversation. Now, I am a bit different. I trust myself um, to go into these conversations. I don't think that you secretly have an agenda to crush all of us. Um, I think Sinn Féin probably wants to make this place work uh, as crazy as that might sound and um, i don't think that they are out to make living conditions worse for anyone and um, but i totally understand the hesitation to kind of get involved with that conversation as well and mm -hmm. um, i think it's just one of those situations that and um, honestly what we need is a wee bit more understanding and this is i put out a tweet the other day about the communities not really wanting to understand each other and uh, some people were like oh there's plenty of people who want to and 
And I get that. I get that there's plenty of people with the right intentions, but it's not good enough. Like genuinely, until you're willing to sit down in front of a loyalist or you're willing to sit down in front of a Republican and see everything that you would say in private, say it to their face and give them a chance to respond um, give them a chance to correct any misconceptions that you've had. Give them a chance to show you that they're good, decent people um, and not just a, a sort of agent of their political group. They're not just an agent of unionism or an agent of republicanism. This is a human being with these opinions. Um, until we adopt that kind of a mindset and that kind of approach, um, I don't expect things to get any better. I expect unionists and loyalists to continue to throw the middle finger up to the conversation. I expect republicanism to, to sort of continue to look at a bonfire and think of it as just a big pile of hate. Hold, 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 for a second, but hold, hold for a second on that, Joel. Is there an element of a fear in unionism that they would be afraid they will do to us what we did to them? It might be. It, it could be where that's rooted. No one said that explicitly. Um, but it definitely could be where, you know, if you get into the... Because see, what you've got to understand is a lot of people are kind of post-Troubles mm-hmm. nowadays. Even the ones who were alive during the Troubles, were a lot of them were very young. Um, so a lot of them were school kids and, and, and et cetera. A lot of my family were, were in school. You know, they tell me stories of having to walk home because the school bus had a bomb threat, et cetera. Um, so a lot of them were very young. So it's not like, you know, I don't think that there's uh, too many, say, former RUC officers sitting in their living rooms and... They don't want to talk about this United Ireland because they themselves went out with a bat and started beating Catholics and they don't want that to happen to them. You know, I don't think that that's the case, but it could be where those um, where those fears and mistrusts are rooted. You know, it could be uh, we know where we were. We know where we are. We know what, you know, if, if we were to engage with the United Ireland debate, obviously Republicanism would have, um, and rightly so, a lot of influence over what that United Ireland might look like. Mm-hmm. Um Maybe there is that fear of, oh, would it be designed in a way that would discriminate against us in the same way that we discriminated against the others back then? Let, let, let me throw a couple of things past you. In the past, Eamon O'Quiv, who is the grandson of the founder of Fianna Fáil and, and uh, founding father of the Republic, Eamon O'Quiv has suggested that Ireland would join the Commonwealth, the British Commonwealth, as was. Jim O'Callaghan, who is touted as a future leader of Fianna Fáil, has suggested that in a United Ireland, the Shannon, the Upper House, should sit in Stormont, in Bel- Stormont outside Belfast and the Dáil sit in Dublin as a symbol of of inclusiveness. Do any of those ideas cut any ice uh, on the on the streets of East Belfast? <laughs> I mean, they certainly do for me. What that tells me is that people are, are are serious about sort of the conversation and that it's not a case of they've got an idea of what they want and they're coming to just work out a way to get us to accept it. Mm-hmm. You know, those, those comments kind of say that there really is a willingness from some parties to talk and genuinely ask, well, what is it that would convince you? What can we give, et cetera? However, I have to say that probably is just for me. Um, I've never heard anyone else talk about those kind of things. Um, I'd imagine the response wouldn't be too friendly if I did ask people's opinion, <laughs> and I will. But um, that's a shame, and that's the kind of thing that we're going to have to work on, because personally, I think that that's at least a very first start. Okay. As, as you mentioned, you live in a working class loyalist area. What sort of people vote for the Alliance Party? Um. <laughs> I don't know if I know anyone that votes for the Alliance Party. <laughs> they, they got more than one eighth of the votes in the recent election and, and an awful lot of votes in Belfast. I, when you say that, I actually, I believe you. I think you might be correct. But my impression is that there is a chunk of the population which maybe not exclusively, but largely comes from families, from areas, from people who would normally or previously have been expected to be unionists. And... They are younger than average and they have just no interest in the sectarian divide. I suspect they're probably significantly more middle class than average, that they are engaged in issues like climate change, in debates like equal marriage and abortion rights, Mm -hmm. and that those things are just way up there in their consciousness and in their concerns much more than the union. And that is part of the demographic explanation for the decline in unionist parties that perhaps not in working class areas, but in, although perhaps to a degree, but in other areas, they are 
not so much, you know, it's not a demographic shift. It's an ideological shift. You're losing a chunk of the demographic unionism mm -hmm. is. W would you think that's a good analysis? Yeah, it probably is. I mean, although I say I don't know anyone that's voted for Alliance um, personally, I know there's, there probably would be quite a lot of, I think women as well is the other thing. You know, a lot of young girls, um, well, I say young girls, you know, girls in their late teenage years of voting age, um, I think they go Alliance too. Um, I don't run about with those. I don't run about with a, a load of teenage girls. So it's uh, <laughs> that's probably why I don't know so many people that's voted for them. But yeah, they definitely do have support from those demographics that you were saying. They're mm -hmm. usually younger, um, more liberal, more open-minded. Um, their focus is just elsewhere other than, you know, they're not sitting there in their rooms thinking about how the union flag got taken down from City Hall. They're sitting in the rooms mm -hmm. thinking about how we can make sure that um, discrimination against, say, gay people is isn't going to happen anymore, or even women, I suppose. You, you, um, you actually, you actually came, came exactly on, onto what I was going to mention. I've got it in my notes here. The flags, flags, uh, shall we say, controversy that was mm -hmm. very intense a few years back. There is a chunk of the population that is enormously turned off by that. They don't give a flying fig what fa flag flies over Belfast City Hall. What they care about are the type of issues that I mentioned. And it is entirely possible that you've got not a small number of people whose parents, maybe now elderly, are loyal DUP voters, who they are perhaps ever more loyal alliance voters. And when somebody somebody like Kelly Armstrong comes on and says, well, yeah, I'm from a unionist background, but I'm looking at all this Brexit nonsense in the UK and the, the social progress that has been made in the Republic, and I'm tending more towards being in the Republic would be more advantageous for Northern Ireland. That's a big shift, isn't it? Definitely. And it's been sort of, uh, I think that movement has been helped by people like Boris and the laws that he's... I mean, even now, I, even me, someone who's a, I would say I'm a pretty firm loyalist, or... I would say I'm a firm unionist, um, soft loyalist, but we'll not get into that. Sure. Um, Boris Johnson and what I was saying that he was doing earlier about the um, laws against sort of demonstrating and breaking up, like that genuinely worries me. To me, the kind of laws that the British government have been passing are, they, they really worry me about the future because I'm going like if, if Boris Johnson was a, was a tyrant, um, he's not going to pass all of the laws that he needs to, to play with play his game you know he's not going to do it what they're going to do is pass all these laws now let him take the blame for him so that everyone forgets that these laws exist and then someone two or three two or three sort of positions down the line so not, maybe not the next prime minister maybe not the one after that but the one after that i mean that could be a real bad egg for us and it could seriously threaten our security and our safety and our democratic values and our freedom genuinely mm -hmm. and so even now i am looking at the republic and i'm looking at the united ireland question and even if it isn't a case of, well, I think that this is better for us now, it, it's it's certainly not as clear cut. Whenever I was whenever I was young, it was very much the UK is better for us and always will be. Mm -hmm. Now it's it's certainly not the case. Um, now I am considering different options. Um, still a unionist, still want to be part of the United Kingdom for now. But I think anyone who looks at what Boris and his and his boys have been doing lately and doesn't worry about B Boris has resigned. Kingdom, You're aware of that. Yeah, but has he really? <laughs> well, is well, my well, question. I, I doubt if he will. He will last much longer, and I very much expect Liz Truss will win in about a month's time. But I want to—he's still going to be there in the in the corridors of power. Is my point? You know, they all pick each other. They all come from the same high schools. They're all friends. They're mm -hmm. all going to put each other in the government positions. It, it's not like Boris resigning means he's resigning out of politics and he's going to go write a book and make a couple million or something. Um, although he might do that as well. He's still going to be there. He'll maybe be on the next government. He'll he'll still be in parliament. Uh, he'll still be making. Uh, moves, political moves. So, to, to be honest, I suspect he won't. But I think what you're saying is broadly correct in the sense that people like him, people he went to school with, will be in that position. Yeah. But what I want to get at is the fact that this very hard, sharp divide that you've talked about in Northern Ireland that existed previously, it is dissolving. And the middle, the, you know, there will no longer be a majority of anybody. The middle will be what flips it. And whichever of the two traditional communities is most giving, is most appealing to the other, will be the one that will win. 
because the more giving they are, the less motivated the other side will be to oppose them resolutely. So, and I say this to nationalists as well, that if you want a united Ireland, the only thing you should care about is to make the Republic now and the putative Northern Ireland as welcoming and as beneficial to unionists as possible. And for unionists, what if you want to maintain the union, what you need to do is to demotivate nationalism by making Northern Ireland so good for them that they would think it isn't even worth the bother. And it strikes me that not always, but mostly, the nationalists are winning that game. I'd probably have to agree with you again. Um, I- where they're not helped is when things, you know, like the videos of the pe- people singing IRA chants. Now, to me, they're a bit mm-hmm. of a gimmick. Mm-hmm. They're a bit of a, I mean, that's that's one incident. I, I don't know. I just, I'm not as invested in those incidents as other people seem to be. Yeah. But yeah, I would say that's that would be unionism's response. Or what about this group of kids who were singing Ra songs at this event? Mm-hmm. Um, but Although, yeah, overall, put that in contrast, and nationalist, because because there will be a nationalist answer to that, which I want you to react to. That that's a few people, probably several jars in singing admittedly pretty vile songs and there's no shortage of footage online of the same thing happening uh, yeah. at unionist events but also the bonfires that you can pretty much see from space which have fire engines attending and the fire engines are needed to hose down the nearby houses because the heat from the bonfires is so intense that it threatens mm-hmm. to set them ablaze and the fire brigade are under orders to hose down the houses and not to put out the fire. And on those fires, very frequently, you have explicit slogans advocating the murder of Catholics. You have people like Michelle O'Neill, also Naomi Long, and other figures, notably a lot of female figures, being hanged in effigy. That is absolutely appalling in a modern society, isn't it? I think with the effigies and election posters, etc., yes, um, you're absolutely right. There's no shortage of the same um, types of things being displayed uh, by unionists and loyalists. In terms of things like the, well, I'll start with the fire engine thing. Yeah, see, the bonfires is an interesting thing. I personally don't mind the beacons, which I saw, which I think were fantastic. I think they do the job. Uh, go back a second, beacons? Yeah, there's there's beacons that some areas have adopted now. They're much smaller and they're much more secure. So they're not just loose piles of wood. They're kind of in a, a, a metal frame and they get lit. They've got like a little pike on the top. They're just much smaller, safer, more historically accurate. They're to me, they're better in every way. I appreciate that they're not for everyone. Um, the other two things that I would like to talk about is the is the slogans and the flag burnings. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, I don't care if you want to burn a flag. You want to burn my Union Jack as a as a political statement. You, I, I'm not going to have an issue with it. You do it. Um, when people have tricolors on bonfires, I look at it as a political statement. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that nationalism is right to complain about it. They should complain about it. Um, I don't like. I, I asked a few people that I was at the bonfire with. And not one of them even noticed that there was a tricolor on the one we were watching, which is why I find it difficult what, what to... What does K-A-T stand for? Kill all Tags. Tags being Catholics. Yep. Th- that, that, that would, in many countries, and quite possibly in Northern Ireland, if it wasn't in a very heightened context that it is, that would attract a criminal charge. Mm-hmm. That's outrageous, yeah. isn't it? I wouldn't like them. Um, I would condemn them. I would say, I know I've never wrote K-A-T on the side of a wall. Um, the difficulty for me is like I know a couple of the people who who would write things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's wrong, and like I would say to them, you know, what the hell are you do? Like I would I would agree with you that it is completely wrong. I'm not defending it at all. Um, but I think to diagnose it as this person's actually calling for the murder of all Teagues, um, I just I just don't think it's accurate. And I fully appreciate that from your point of view, it's it's hard. It's hard to construe any other meaning on it. Yeah, and 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 it's hard because I'm not trying to defend it, and I don't want to defend it. Mm -hmm. Um, What I'm doing is I'm saying I've I've heard this from I've heard from Republicans. I've heard the this is wrong. People are calling for for the slaughtering of Catholics and 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 such. And then I'm looking at the people writing this stuff. I'm talking to them about it. I'm I'm listening to why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And there's just a mismatch there. So the Catholics are right to look at that and, and sort of feel threatened. Um, the police I'm, I'm right actually not so interested. To, to be honest, Joel, I, I think we're clearly 
I am interested and, and clearly there is an issue there about how Catholics react to that. But what I'm much more thinking about is a section of the loyalist struck unionist community, younger, no. That section that I described probably turning to be alliance voters who are turned yeah. off by this big time and who mm -hmm. are campaigning on other issues and will show up at maybe meetings, maybe demonstrations or whatever on whatever topic, marriage equality, abortion rights, climate change, and a host of other topics that are kind of fairly typical of younger politics these days. They're not attra attached to a specific political party, but the people involved are very attached to those. And they show up at these and they are likely to meet nationalists and Republicans, often Sinn Féin members, often SDLP members. That isn't a smart strategy, quite apart from the offence being caused just within unionism. That's not a smart strategy, is it? No. No, I would say um, anyone who does write things like that on walls or, or, or hang up things, even the flags, even though I'm not as immediately opposed to the burning of flags, I still don't think tricolour should be on bonfires. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. It's a self-destructive um, way to go about things. It's only going to harm mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Which and, is why we should stop. Yes. And you will not be old enough to remember, but I'm sure you have heard tell of the unbelievable behavior against schoolgirls. And when I say schoolgirls, I mean like five to 12 year olds at Holy Cross School in Belfast. And with the very strange geography that you'll be familiar with in Belfast, the, the walk to school for those Catholic schoolgirls, which was at an all Catholic school, brought them down a road perhaps not exactly through a Protestant area, but down a road that formed the border of a Protestant area. The Protestants, or many of them in that area, took great exception to this. And there was an intense and incredibly bitter protest against that, where on many occasions there were hundreds of police trying to defend schoolgirls and their parents bringing them to school. This gained appalling coverage, TV coverage for the unionist cause really across the world. And in fairness to the many unionist politicians disavowed this. The leader of the Conservative Party at the time showed up on the basis of saying that he wanted to see the facts on the ground and was so disgusted with what was happening. He, the leader of the Conservative Party from London, insisted on walking with the schoolgirls. One of those girls now grown up graduated and there was a photograph shown uh, shared on Twitter of her graduating and intending to become a teacher on a loyalist bonfire quite obviously drawn from that photograph that was shared on Twitter was an effigy of that young woman that is shocking behavior isn't it I would say it's it's a step further than shock and I would say it's kind of it's pretty evil sounds pretty evil to me sounds pretty corrupted mm -hmm. um yeah, that's that's really sad to hear. Okay, and, and but how? And and I want to use a we here, and it's not a royal we. We as people of Ireland, north or south, how do we deal with that? Well, it, that took quite a few people to do, and it took a lot more people to not say what in the name of God are you doing? Get that down. Yeah, that that is a shame. Um, I'm I'm sort of trying to think it through. See, the problem with um, was this on a bonfire? Yes. The, the problem with a bonfire, if, if we're genuinely interested in stopping things like that, typically a bonfire will be on a bonfire site and mm -hmm. typically bonfires will be built uh, on those sites. And the year before there was a bonfire on that site, you know, they're not like randomly put up, they're put on in areas and then they're kept in that same place every year. And because of that, naturally, what starts to happen after a while is that there's this like hierarchy of on of ownership. It's unspoken. So you might have someone that's lived beside the bonfire from the were from the were no age and they're now 40 and they've collected for it every year so they they naturally have like a they're in charge you know they run the bonfire and yep. no one really gets any uh sort of input on it yeah it's, um, it's, it's, they, they have a degree of informal social control these people would yep. not necessarily be a million miles either from the UDA or probably some other groups and probably yeah. often not always, and perhaps not even in the majority, but a significant number of times, not a million miles from racketeering, low-level drug dealing. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, and um, where okay. and, and I can hear you're being very conciliatory on that, and you're, you're. I think if people, I will be most certainly linking your Twitter in the notes for this podcast, and it is a breath of fresh air from Northern Ireland, and you certainly show a much broader capacity for thinking than an awful lot of people around you might do. What it but, might be, mm -hmm. what that might be, just to explain that, um, 
because this might be important. Um, mm-hmm. Whenever I was growing up, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with this place at all. I wanted to get out. Um, I wanted to leave. This place was such a mess. The people were crazy. Um, everyone's fighting over all this silly nonsense. Like, I just wanted out of here. I wanted to wipe my hands clean of the place. So learning about politics, I, I learned a lot about American politics and how it works. And I followed American politics whenever I was young. And then whenever I kind of had an epiphany at one point, can't remember when it was, but it was, you know, I'm not going to leave this place and leave everyone that I know and love sort of the the wallow in the crap. You know, I'm going to mm-hmm. do what I can to try and fix this place and and, and that kind of a thing. And so for me, like whenever I was learning about Northern Ireland, I was applying it to like I'd learned politics the American way. And then I was applying that here. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't always a, a proud loyalist. I never used to like the 12th, never really used to care about the bone fires um, never really would have called myself a, a loyalist. Um, mm-hmm. That's come in later and I'm able to apply the, the systems sort of that I learned about in America and all that groundwork, all that foundation. And then I'm looking at Northern Ireland kind of in a similar way to if you picture someone, some student in Queen's University looking at, uh, I don't know, the Middle East. Um, they come in, they look at the different sides and then they're trying to piece things together and they're trying to write the report in the most fair and reflective way that they can. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, that's very similar to how I approach Northern Ireland. And that's probably why people will say things like, oh, I'm a breath of fresh air and this and that. It doesn't feel like I'm doing anything extraordinary. I think can that's I, can just I just ask you, when, when you were contemplating leaving, where would you have contemplated going to? Italy. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, that's still a long-term, a long-term goal at one point, maybe. So we'll... We'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay, well, best of luck with that. I think we would be the poorer for it if you were to leave. Not sure how much Italy would benefit. That's a, a whole different uh, <laughs> a, a whole different debate. One thing that you mentioned that I just want to go back to is that as you were growing up and you saw the divide and your view was that Britain, UK, was better for you. It was better to be attached mm. to the UK. Was that a raw economic judgment or was that a cultural affinity or was that something else or a mixture of different things what that probably was was just an acceptance of what i had been told so i had Mm -hmm. been told that we would be best in the united kingdom and that there was nowhere better and i just took it and i just accepted it being the little kid that i was Mm -hmm. and you know now growing up i I appreciate that it's much more of a gray area um you can even get into questions of like is there a best place to live or is it is the the best place for each person kind of just whatever suits them best so it's a, it's a whole i'm just i see the nuance now i see that mm-hmm. it isn't a, a black and white and you know i, I also see how the in the future of the united kingdom can go because we spend a lot of time talking about the past we don't spend mm-hmm. nearly enough time talking about the future and with the way things are going you know i think ai is going to be a big threat i think the technology is going to be a big threat and to be honest if we have the same kind of caliber of of leader in the united kingdom as we do today i just i don't have a lot of faith that the united kingdom will be able to come out the other end of that um as appealing as a place as it is today you know know what i mean so Mm -hmm. i am looking at at a lot more um complexities of it and not just boiling it all down to oh yeah we're best we're best as british and that's just the end of it yeah um recently in one of the conservative leadership debates liz truss said of Nicola Sturgeon, but it was fairly clear that it was being applied more widely to the Scottish government. She said the best thing to do with them is ignore them. That doesn't, to me, augur very well for the likelihood of the UK holding together with the SNP, the Scottish government, determined Mm. to have a referendum uh, October 12 months on Scottish independence. It's entirely possible that the UK will not exist in two years' time. What will unionists do if they have nothing to be united to? Well, exactly. This, this is I, I'm screaming at people just to start having conversations about the future. If you don't want to have those conversations with the Republicans, then don't. But then we need to at least start having our own internal conversations because mm-hmm. what's going to happen is at some point, and say Scotland even survives this, well, what happens when there's another one in another 20 years? Um, or what happens when England kind of gets carried away and thinks I, I, I think you might, I think you, I think you might find an awful lot of people in Scotland would attribute surviving something to uh, to the other out- outcome. So, they, they, sorry, what? I, I think you might find an awful lot of people in Scotland would uh, think surviving this would mean becoming independent. 
Right. Well, that's an, I suppose you would if you were if you were in that system and you were looking to leave. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that's there's a possibility too if you think about it. You know, Scotland leaves. You've got what a million unionists here. Who's to say all million of them actually are loyal? To, you know, there's probably a handful of them that are loyal to Scotland mainly. You know, they've got family mm-hmm. in Scotland, they work in Scotland, they've travelled to and from Scotland, um, and that's why they're unionists. So. Yeah. Even all those people, um, our unionist block kind of starts to shrink if Scotland goes independent, which is a, a whole other side of it too. So it definitely is a very complex uh, situation. And to to not talk about the possibilities for our future is it's just political suicide because we can ignore it. We can kick the can down the road all we want, but at some point we're going to have to confront it. And we want to do that sooner rather than later to increase the the chances of a good outcome for for everyone involved. Okay, I want to end with what I think might be a completely irrelevant point. I'll tell you why it's irrelevant, (laughs) perhaps in a moment. But I was reading David McWilliams, a noted economist who has connections to the North as well as the South. In his book, most recently, he pointed out that just three counties, Antrim, Down and Armagh, at the time of partition, just those three counties accounted for 70% of the GDP of the island of Ireland. So when Northern Ireland was created, its economy, not per person, just in absolute terms, its economy mm-hmm. was more than three times larger than the economy of the what became the Republic. Now, thanks to Wikipedia, I can see in GDP terms, the economy of the Republic is more than eight and a half times bigger than the economy of the North. Again, all in absolute terms, no no per capita or anything, just in absolute terms. So at a minimum, in the last century, the economy of the Republic has grown 25 times faster than the economy of the North. That's unsustainable in terms of in terms of an economic gradient that people wouldn't want to wouldn't want to get on the other side of, isn't it? Yeah, well, whenever whenever I was younger, I remember very clearly um, that was one of the big arguments against Ireland was how poor its economy was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't want anything to do with that. And even the fact that that argument doesn't really get um, used as much anymore mm-hmm. um, says a lot. Um, but I think it just kind of all that does for me, all that does is speaks to the volatility of everything. So nothing's nothing's forever. Um, if Ireland has a better economy today, or if it had a worse economy today, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the same tomorrow. But if, across, uh, a, century, across have a century, averaged across a century, 25-fold, is just mind-blowing, a 25-fold difference that the Republic has on average grown 25 times faster. Yeah, I mean, I, I congratulate them. <laughs> I'm happy for them. Um, as someone who has never, like, it's, I don't feel that my unionist position has ever relied too heavily on um our economy so it doesn't it doesn't rock it doesn't make my identity rock or anything too much um i think that that's the point um yes i think i think it is and you've you've got to the point why i said that it was probably irrelevant because this isn't although it may have been dressed up as that this was never really an economic concern for working class unionists loyalists it was a cultural divide always that is true isn't it yeah, I would probably agree with you. I would probably agree with you. That's one of the things I noticed um, when it, whenever I was younger, whenever you were talking about a united Ireland and mm-hmm. say someone was to, or even the Irish language, because this demonstrates the same point and it's much more recent. Mm-hmm. So whenever I went to Linda and I had said, you know, here's my concern about Irvine. the price. This is Linda Irvine, yeah. Um, so I'd said, here's my concern is the price. Um, do enough people speak it to justify the cost? And she was able to kind of walk me through the, the models that she had in mind and how it wouldn't end up... Um, cost us a whole lot um but then i was able to actually change my position then on an irish language act Mm -hmm. and whenever i was talking about the republic back whenever i was younger with people it felt very different it felt very much like well here's this argument um against joining the republic and it might have been the economy at the time and now you've got a situation where the economy's stronger but I thought they don't change their opinion. The people who kind of relied on that point point back then um because there was other wee things that came up and I just find that whenever you showed them that, well, this argument that you've just given me doesn't really apply or doesn't really make sense, it was never a, oh, hang on, I had a complete misunderstanding of the situation then. It was just a, all right, well, then we're straight away going to move on to the next argument against the United Ireland. It never felt like it was a, a position that people had arrived to after long and careful thought 
mm -hmm. concluded that they didn't want to be part of the Republic and concluded that they were against the United Ireland, it always has felt like people assume these positions and then go looking for any reason that they can to ever strengthen their own opinion or attack the other opinion. And and I just I just don't get the point of, uh, on the, in that style of doing things um, at all. Joel Keyes, loyalist activist in Belfast and active Twitter on Twitter. Thank you very much for talking to me. Never miss a show. Follow at Here's How Podcast on Twitter and like Here's How on Facebook for updates on each show's contents. Go to the website for sources and references from the show. And while you're there, you can like the show on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at Here's How Podcast and follow Joel Keys at Joel Keys NI. I know I always say that, but he is the guest that I think you absolutely should follow on Twitter at Joel Keys NI. And get in touch with me if you can suggest a guest or topic for the next show. And thanks again to all of the patrons on Patreon. As I said, we don't get anything like what some big Irish podcasters get, but it pays for things like web hosting. We basically do the podcast for free on our own time. But if you could do the same as the current patrons and donate the price of a pint of beer or even just a liter of milk once or twice a month, please do go and sign up at patreon.com slash here's how. That link is on the website. Also there you can find out how to subscribe to the podcast for free on your computer, on your phone or by email. All that information is at www.hereshow.ie. The Here's How podcast is produced and presented by me, William Campbell. The assistant producer is Kevin Wolf. Thank you for listening. Thank you.